Thank you so much for joining this Cambridge Judge Business School series, Leadership in Unprecedented Times. I'm Sandra Dawson. Um, I'm a fellow of Judge Business School and a member of the advisory board, but perhaps better known to many of you as being one of the first directors of the school. I was thrilled, privileged and delighted to lead it from 1995 to 2006 as it was growing into the great business school it is today. We're truly honoured as part of this series to be in the presence of Wendy Williams, one of His Majesty's Inspectors of Constabulary and Inspectors of Fire and Rescue Service, and very importantly, a recent recruit uh, to Cambridge Judge Business School's Advisory Board. Beyond that, she's a non-executive director of the Financial Services Compensation Scheme, a commissioner on the Institute of Government's Commission on Civil Service, and a member of the advisory board of the University of Oxford and Cambridge's Commission on Closing the Gap to ensure that our universities are truly open and inclusive. Wendy is the author of the independent Windrush Lessons Learned Review into the Home Office and its handling of events leading up to what became known as the Windrush Scandal. Her review was presented to Parliament in 2020 and she was then invited back two years later to see the progress that was made by the Home Office in implementing her 30 recommendations. And she published a progress report in 2022. It was an enormous privilege for me to be an expert member of the independent advisory group that Wendy selected to support her review of the scandal which originated in events of 75 years ago when the Boat Empire Windrush landed in the UK. Wendy, it's fantastic to see you and thank you so much for taking the time to join me in conversation today. We're really thrilled that you're able to enrich this series of global leaders talking about the challenges. To start, can you begin by telling us a little bit about yourself and your background and how your journey led you to be commissioned to undertake the Windrush Review? Thank you very much, Sandra, for this kind invitation to, to take part in the discussion today. It's an absolute privilege for me to be able to, to do so. In terms of my background, my parents came to the UK from Guyana, which is in South America. For those of you who don't know, they came in the 60s and settled here. And I was fortunate enough to be born here. I was schooled here and I qualified as a solicitor. I became a partner in a firm and then I crossed over to the public sector from the private sector and became a chief crown prosecutor. And there I was responsible for prosecutions in the northeast of the country where I've come from today, in fact. So I was responsible for prosecutions in Northumbria, Cleveland and Durham. And uh, we prosecuted in excess of 70,000 cases in the Crown Court and 7,000 cases in the Magistrates Courts. Actually, it's the other way around. And then in 2015, I was appointed as one of uh, Her Majesty's, now His Majesty's, inspectors of constabulary. I am one of four people and I'm responsible for inspecting 13 of the 42 police forces in England and Wales, as well as 11 of the 45 farm rescue services in the west of England. And then in 2018, I got the call from the Home Secretary, the then Home Secretary, and I was asked to carry out the review of what became known as the Windrush scandal. Well, let's put that conversation into perspective, because there may be some of our listeners all over the world who are not familiar with this real terrible scandal 
of the way in which people were treated, originating, as I said, 75 years ago. Can you just tell us a bit about the Windrush generation and uh, what unfolded for the next 75 years into which you inquired? Yes, as I've indicated, my parents uh, form part of the Windrush cohort and the Windrush generation came to the UK from the Caribbean between 1948 and 1973, answering an invitation from the British government to help rebuild post-war Britain. They came, they settled, they made the UK their home. They regarded themselves as British, and indeed they were, because the 1971 Immigration Act made that clear. But they lacked the documents to prove it, and official records weren't kept. Now, some people went on to register their status, and indeed, my parents were among them, but others didn't, and they didn't register their status because they relied on the assurances given by government at the time that there would be no disadvantages, no penalties to not registering their status because they were British and everyone accepted it and it was enshrined in statute. However, as successive governments set out to try to prove that they were being tough on immigration, they introduced a series of immigration controls, which included a policy called the Hostile Environment Policy. And those members of the Windrush generation who were caught up in the Hostile Environment Policy found themselves uh, ill-treated. Now, it's important to make it clear that the policy was designed to deter people who were in the country illegally from staying here. And the expectation was to cut off supplies to jobs, to um, homes, etc., in the hope that those who were here illegally would leave. But, as I said, the Windrush cohort who didn't register their status had status but lacked documentary proof. So those who weren't able to prove their status to the unreasonably high standard that was set, I mean, who could produce the passport that uh, they came to the UK on 50 years ago? I think a few of us could conform to that requirement. And those who couldn't lost jobs, lost homes, lost access to public services like healthcare and their very sense of British identity. And in extreme circumstances, they were locked up, removed and returned to their country of birth, in some cases, a country that they hadn't seen for over 50 years. So that in a very large nutshell is what became known as the Windrush scandal. And as we gathered evidence and as we heard the voices of people who'd been affected, as you say, it was their sense of British identity, but it wasn't even just British identity, it was their whole identity because they had lived and been and served Britain and the feeling that they had to somehow prove what their right was heartbreaking. I think if you could just in a nutshell tell us something about your recommendations that you made 30 very important recommendations. You're not going to be able to go through all of them for us today but what would you pick out as being a key finding in the most important recommendations? Well, can I start by thanking you for helping me, Sandra, because you sat on my independent advisory group and your counsel was really valued and invaluable. And in terms of the review itself, I found that the scandal was both foreseeable and avoidable, and that it occurred as a result of various political, cultural and organisational factors. Uh, and we can perhaps explore that in a little more depth. 
but um, I made 30 recommendations, as you rightly point out, and they boiled down to three aspects. The first was that the Home Office should recognise that it had been responsible for a profound institutional failure and a serious social injustice, and it should apologise. The second aspect was that it should open itself up to wider external scrutiny. And the third related to policy making. And what I said in that respect was that the department should change its culture and should appreciate that social policy, no matter what its objective, should be rooted in humanity because after all, it's about people. Absolutely. I'm very interesting that you choose to summarize political, cultural, and I think you said social. And those are some of the hardest things to change. Um, in terms of the way in which the Home Office went about it, when you went back to have a look two years later, can we just talk about where you saw any steps being taken with regard to the cultural aspects first? Well, if I talk about the Home Office's culture as I reported it in 2020, I described a culture of carelessness and thoughtlessness and disbelief. And in essence, and one can to an extent understand it, but in essence, the department's approach was that anyone who was seeking to prove their right to be in the UK was in all likelihood uh, not uh, genuine in their applications. So, so that tended to be the starting point. And that was born of a culture in the organisation whereby the voices of others weren't listened to. And I, by that, I mean not only the voices of the people making the applications, but also the voices of the members of staff who were processing those applications. So to give you an example, when we carried out the original review, I spoke to, and I think it did run into hundreds, if not edging towards uh, a thousand of the 38,000 Home Office staff. And what struck me was that those staff who were in the junior grades, who were responsible for processing so many of the applications, themselves had friends or family who came from that particular cohort. And they were flagging these warning signs that people seemed to be coming forward who didn't fit the prototype that the policy was aimed towards. But notwithstanding their repeated warnings and flags, uh, they were disregarded and the department pursued the policy out of this relentless belief, this unquestioning belief that the policy was correct and therefore by extension, it naturally would be effective. So fast forwarding to the revisit, what I was pleased to see was that the Home Office took my review seriously. They put together their own, they called it a comprehensive improvement plan, which was published and which is available on gov.uk even now. But they set about changing the culture by instituting a people and change programme. It was called One Home Office, and it, it actually involved going stripping things right back to first principles. So what's our mission? What's our purpose? What are we here to do? We're here to serve the public, to protect them and to keep them safe whoever they are and whichever background they come from. And so they built on the mission and the purpose and then developed a vision. And that involved senior leaders being very clear about their vision, their expectations and the expectations that they would hold 
their direct reports and their direct reports, direct reports to account for. So the Home Office did approach matters fundamentally, and I was pleased to see that. Well, as we talk about culture and people and change, these have read across right through the organisations today. Um, whether one's in the public sector, the private sector, you're in a small startup, you're in a charity, um, the culture that is created and led from the top, but has to be supported by listening and by an understanding and curiosity that those at the top of the organisation don't hold all the information and don't hold all the knowledge. How have you found um, the work that you did with the Windrush Review um, its relevance to other sorts of organisations, what would you pick out for leadership? Leadership, as this series is, of unprecedented times. What's really, for you, important for leadership, wherever you are, in terms of your learnings from the Windrush Review? Well, I'm fortunate enough to have worked in all three sectors, so voluntary, public and private, I'm also fortunate enough to have had great opportunities during my career, both to work in large organisations and indeed smaller organisations, but then to have the opportunity to inspect and review those really large organisations of which the Home Office is, is one. And what I found was that my work as an inspector of the police and the fire service did bring out, it drew out some common themes, which I saw evident uh, in the Home Office, and which I do think hold true for all organisations or certainly many organisations. And I think the first is the operating environment. The operating bar environment is often hostile, by which I mean um, there are ever decreasing resources, but ever increasing expectations of senior leaders who run organisations. And I think it can be so tempting to cut corners when that's the case, but what I've found in my work experience and also in reviewing organisations is that if senior leaders can be courageous but also have conviction, and I don't mean have the courage of their convictions, albeit that that in itself is important, but I mean be courageous be very clear about what you're there to do. Who are you there to serve? How are you going to serve them? And what can you offer in order to improve the situation for your customers or indeed for victims or indeed for the wider public? So I think there are some, some common themes. And by being courageous, I mean being absolutely clear in terms of what you want to achieve. What is the mission? What is the vision? How are you going to bring your workforce with you? And how are you going to demonstrate to your workforce that, um, that actually they should have confidence in you and that you will do right by them. Because that does seem to generate a real sense of commitment and conviction on the part of the workforce as a whole. I think one of the developments that I was less aware of, certainly in the formative stages of my career, but uh, increasingly so more latterly is the social media and the wider media perspective, because that introduces a whole new layer of accountability, but also immediacy of expectation. And so given that, Obviously, government is working to electoral cycles, but also given that industry is working to its own set of challenges, 
that can lead to some sort of perverse um, e examples. But I think that if people can remain true to themselves, if their value system is uncompromised, and if they are uncompromising in securing that, then hopefully they will be able to have the resilience to be able to withstand the onslaught of the various challenges that they may face. It's very interesting thinking about social media, because I think both you and I believe that listening and being open to new ideas is fundamentally important wherever you are, but it's especially important at the top of the organisation when so many things are coming at you there's a tendency to be sort of frozen on those and to bring your courage and your conviction onto those but separate out that which is going on outside so you've got to be very open but the curious thing about social media which on the one hand is immensely open is it can be very very polarized and very um negative so that uh, you, you've got to be able to extract the gems, but you've also got mm. to be able to screen out um, a, lot of the, a lot of the noise, which will just derail you. And I think coping with that, keeping the door open, keeping the funnel open, and at the same time being clear on what you're going, how you're going to go forward is probably one of the most difficult dilemmas that many of us face. I think that's absolutely true. And I think it does come back to how it is that leaders communicate with their own organisations, because just to, to, to repeat that part of the cause of Windrush was that people weren't listened to. They had some excellent ideas. They identified the risks. And yet those risks weren't appreciated, they weren't flagged, um, and that tracked through right to the very top of the organisation. And I've mentioned risk, and I'll come back to that, but just to finish on the communication point, if everyone feels that there is an atmosphere of trust in their organisation and that they can speak up, then you do get a diverse range of views. And that's where the magic really happens because you can create, you can innovate and you can improve. And at the same time, as you say, managing all that, but also having a sort of laser-like focus on where you've got to go to. So Absolutely. being, um, again, that dilemma of openness and questioning and curiosity, and also laser-like focus on where you want to go. And also perhaps something we've not talked about, the standards that we expect um, to be open and caring and thoughtful doesn't mean at all that one is tolerating poor behavior, far from it, or indeed poor performance. And so again, how one manages um, aspects of performance, keeping the focus on where you're going, whilst at the same time being building trust with people around you. That's, again, something that people have to see you and believe in your legitimacy in the actions that you're taking. And that's so true, because if, if you are leading an organisation where there is that bond of trust, then you can have those um, nice conversations, but also those difficult conversations when it comes to performance management, because if the individual is absolutely clear about what the expectations are, what they're expected to achieve and how they're expected to do so, then they will be open to that regular and open dialogue, which is a dialogue, which is a two way conversation. And they, because I've had examples where people that I've worked with and who've worked for me have said to me, oh, I wasn't terribly good in that respect. And, and this is where I think I need to improve. So, so in actual fact, it does become a virtuous circle because of that trust, which is so important to establish. Yes, yeah. Many of the people um, sharing this video with us, whenever they come onto it, will be people who studied at 
Cambridge Judge Business School, might it be as an undergraduate or an MBA or a, someone who's working in social entrepreneurship, a wide variety of management and leadership courses. And they'll be at the beginning or in the middle of their career. When you look back on your career, what would you say, oh, I wish I'd known that? Um, is there anything you'd like to share from where you are now, looking back and thinking, oh, that would have been so helpful if I'd thought about that? Uh, there are a couple of things. I, I should start by saying I am coming towards the end of my career um, because <laughs> I, I recently renewed my practicing certificate um, for the, I think it was the 32nd year. And that came as such a horrible shock to me that um, what I concluded was that I must have been a child prodigy and I must have qualified at the age of two. So uh, that's how I've reconciled that uh, issue to myself. But in looking back, I do think that what I would have liked to have known as a younger version of me was just how enjoyable my career was going to be. And I could have just relaxed a bit more and enjoyed it because I felt looking back, I feel that I spent so much time trying to get, you know, that next opportunity, trying to, to get to that next stage that I almost didn't take enough time to just enjoy the moment, to enjoy the atmosphere, the working environment that I was in. So I think that's, that's one of the key uh, learning points for me. A second one would be to have confidence in my abilities, because looking back, you know, I am able to, to say that, yes, there are some things, there are a number of things that uh, I would have done differently, but I do have the capacity to really crunch through and, you know, get the learning that I need to acquire the skills that I need to. And I wish, looking back, that I'd had that self-assurance earlier in my career and I think the final piece of learning for me relates to um, just speaking up a bit more, by which I mean um, it won't have escaped the, the attention of people, you won't escape this, uh, but I am a black female. And I think that throughout my career, I perhaps haven't done enough within that context, I mean, through the lens of uh, being a black woman, I have seen myself as a person in the workplace, a colleague, and I have done, hopefully, some work to try to bring people after me. But I think in my respective positions, I could have perhaps spoken up more. And I'm, I'm not talking about it in a tub thumping sort of way, because people who know me know that I'm not really a tub thumper. I'm quite, I'm, I'm quite boring. I'm quite conservative with a small p in many ways. But I just wish that I'd spoken up a bit more. So that's what I would tell my younger self with a wagging index finger, Sandra. <laughs> well, that's why your career is nowhere near towards the end of it. I mean, speaking personally, I never dreamt that I, at the age I am, I'd be um, very active with new opportunities coming in and the same will be for you. But I think that that, that capacity to speak up, um, certainly for me, has become a very important theme of my life. And I, I do know that there are instances where um, probably I wasn't as vocal as I now wish I would be. But the good news is one can be utterly vocal now. And uh, so yes. one, one comes <laughs> into the role of, um, and I find when I'm faced with maybe sexist or racist language, I now, I never let it go and I do, uh, often put my um, response in the form of a question. You know, why would you say that? What's the mm. evidence for that? 
uh, or that's hurtful. I think that the that um, the way in which one uh, it's a culture of the organization as well, because if the leaders show themselves um, to be uh, quite clear about what their values are and what is uh, acceptable and what is not, uh, then that also uh, empowers other people and builds a culture, as we talked about. This series is about unprecedented times. And indeed, these last four years have been extraordinarily unprecedented. Pandemic huge uncertainty on the global change, even stronger geopolitical tensions um, this year than, than last year, shifting movements in public opinion, cost of living crisis, climate anxiety and degradation, polarization of arguments, as we mentioned, amplified by social media. What do you think as you look to the future? Do you think it will be a different future for us, for our organizations, for our communities? Um, and have we got any idea about, as individuals and as communities, as public institutions and indeed as countries, how we really are going to build a better future for generations to come? I think there are all sorts of opportunities for the future, Sandra. Um, and we, I have to keep that uh, very much at the forefront of my views. I do think that the pandemic has totally shifted the way that we transact business in the workplace now. I also think that the developments with technology, we've talked about social media, but also the wider uh, developments in technology risk that interaction, that personal interplay between individuals just receding more and more. And we've started to see some of that started as a result of uh, COVID. The very fact that you and I are communicating in this way today is a mark of the change in how we communicate. So many of us work from home for much, if not most, if not in some cases, all of the time. And that therefore means that our frame of reference is that much more limited. And then if you overlay that with what we were talking about earlier, which is the narrow parameters of social media, and the algorithmic approaches, which mean that uh, if you access certain sites, then, you know, the next thing you know, you're being bombarded with similar sites, then that can serve to confirm views rather than broaden views. So I think that the combination of increased isolation together with the breakneck speed with which technology is improving is such that, or are such that, we have to be vigilant. So I think for the future, not losing sight of that important personal connection, and it can be via a screen, it can be in person, but I think if anything, it, it amplifies the importance of effective communication and keeping on talking and being open to ideas, never compromising and never taking what might be the path of least resistance because you know if we can keep the world open while recognizing that there are constraints then hopefully that bodes well for the future it, uh, indeed and i think that means there's a great responsibility on the leaders of organizations now to think about what the meaning of the workplace is yes because uh, why should you come in if all you're going to do is sit at a screen you can indeed sit at a screen perfectly well at home. Of course, you miss the, the interactions around the coffee machine and uh, other places, but we've got to think, I think, much more carefully about why people should physically come to work and, and, and reconstruct uh, the nature of the workplace so that one doesn't lose the interpersonal direct uh, connection 
which however wonderful Zoom is, and of course it's very good if you know the person. It's very, very good if you know the person already. If you don't know the person already, it's very difficult to begin to impart those vital cultural um, aspects which we talked about. Wendy, Indeed. it's been wonderful being in conversation. We started with the Windrush Lessons Learned Review, which was of such social, political and cultural importance. And I do think put a marker in the sand for um, race relations and for an understanding of what it means to be part of a shared community. And we've worked through your experiences of work, your experiences of different sorts of organizations. And above all, we've got a sense of Wendy Williams, the woman. Thank you so much for joining us. It's been an absolute delight. The unprecedented times ahead of us are all the better for you being very active in them. Thank you, Sandra. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. And I've also derived a great deal of benefit from the discussion. I was secretly taking notes and uh, it's been a great experience for me. Thank you. And to everyone who's joining this uh, conversation, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we're doing this remotely. Never forget to come and see us in Cambridge, where we'll be delighted to give you the warmest welcome. Thank you very, very much indeed.